Good morning. We come in our daily Bible reading to Matthew chapter 7. And what we find here in this chapter is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. And as Jesus has challenged his audience to consider the ways of what God intended the Old Testament message to be, not just to abstain from murder, but to actually love your neighbor, not just to love those who it's convenient, but to love even and pray for your enemies. The challenge has been heard and issued. As we look at chapter 7, there is this fixation on a pathway. There's going to be two. When you study the scriptures, we need to understand that in the Old and New Testament alike, there is pleasing God and not pleasing God. Now, we like to create different segments, different middle ground territories, and we often ask the question, what about good people? I think Matthew chapter 7 makes it clear that good people do what God says. God is good, and God alone determines what is good, so good people do what God says. That's not a middle category at all. In fact, people who are committed to God do what he says. In Matthew chapter 7, we're going to see there's, there's some ways to call that and refer to that. The question is, what kind of person are we? Are we a narrow way person or a broad way person? Do we do what God says or do we ignore it? Matthew chapter 7, notice some warnings from Jesus and challenges for us to be better in our life as we continue studying the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So we look at this and we say verse 1 is probably one of the most famous passages in the scripture. I don't know how many people know exactly that it's found here, but I wonder how many people do know the phrase, judge not. They know it's a Bible phrase, perhaps even know that that's a Jesus saying. But what does he mean then? What does our Savior mean when he says, judge not that you be not judged? For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Well, again, as we've spoken about in Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be forgiven based upon the way, in part at least, we forgive others. In Matthew chapter 7, it's very clear, hypocritical judgments are being excluded. But our job is not to be a policeman of everyone, but our job is to help, to love. It is not to haughtily or with arrogance judge others as worse than us and be ready to pounce when someone does something wrong. In fact, we're called to be what in Matthew chapter 5? Merciful, peacemakers. Being ready to pounce on people anytime they do something that we don't see as right is a problem not just because we might dis discourage them, but we also might be found with a bigger problem. Isn't that what Jesus writes about here? In verse 2, recognize you're going to be judged the way you judge. That should be frightening enough for us. But in verse 3, why do you see the speck that is in your own in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? So here's this image of Jesus. This tiny little speck is in someone's eye. And here I am saying, hey, you need to fix that. You, you have this sinful problem. Get over yourself. And notice Jesus doesn't say that it's not there. There is something there, and it needs to be fixed. But here I am with this log in my eye, this plank in my own eye. That is a hypocritical judgment. In verse 4, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when there's the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so we recognize that we do have to make judgments. We do have to recognize every day that we have a choice to make. Do I do what God says or not? Do I follow this group? And I am judging whether or not they are following God's word or not. But a good rule of thumb is in verse 2, is this the type of judgment I want to be held to, that I, that I would desire that God hold out to me? And the answer is yes. If it's, is this God's will and it is God's will, then yes, that is how we're going to be judged. But we also need to make sure that I have humility as I'm looking and deciding on whether or not to make such a judgment. And with humility, I will eliminate a lot of the hypocritical judgment. I'm going to examine myself first. I'm going to realize how much I need God's grace and mercy. And that might change the way I look at someone else. I might even extend them the grace and mercy that I desperately want shown to me. Verse 6 also makes it very clear. We have to decide as Christians when to what you might say, take your ball and go home. Not in a rude way, not in an upset way, but frankly, there's going to be audiences of Christianity that reject it. Paul talked to many a person who did not become a Christian, or so it seems. And if you imagine, Paul does not just stay forever there. He moves on. One, because we have jobs to do. We are stewards of God's time, and talking to someone over and over about the same thing who says no, we need to move forward. By the way, that takes a little bit of judgment. But the other thing we have to be careful about in verse 6 is to say, hey, Jesus calls us to figure out who these people are. Well, that is partially true. But again, 
what kind of judgment would you want towards you? Would you want someone to write you off and to say, hey, that person would never X, Y, Z. That person would never please God. That person can never repent. We need to be extra patient, extra merciful, extra gracious, because that's how we want our God to look at us. So do we need to make judgments? Yes. Hypocritical judgments? Of course not. We need to have humility at all times and trust that our God's will is to be done. In verse 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if a son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So we see some wonderful blessings from God. As children of his, who are dedicated to his will, what does he promise? If you ask, it will be given. Seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. Isn't it phenomenal that God wants us to talk to him? And that God will provide for us. Now, what is the spectrum here? Of course, we recognize as Jesus prayed in Matthew chapter 6, we need to be praying that God's will be done. And so we're asking for help along that journey, not to delay us into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. It is a godly prayer. God hears our prayers. He answers them. This is a wonderful thing. Our God knows how to take care of us, perhaps in ways that we don't even think. How many times do we pray for something and we decide this is what we need? This is what I need. This is going to make my life better. This is going to make my life easier. This is going to make me a better Christian. And we actually get something else, and we look at that as an unanswered prayer or a prayer where the answer is no. It turns out that wasn't true. My life is better because I went through X, Y, Z, or because I didn't get to go to ABC. God knows what's best for us. In verse 12, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Verse 12, many know this as the golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Now, when it comes to forgiveness and mercy and treating others kindly, the, the way to look at this passage is not to say, well, I don't mind being treated poorly, so I'm going to treat you poorly. That's not the takeaway. The takeaway is we care for ourselves. We love ourselves, in fact. It's a challenge to love others, and the challenge is to love others sacrificially. Jesus is going to expand on this, ch this challenge in John chapter 13. We don't just love the way we want to be loved. We love the way Jesus loved us, which is to the utmost of sacrifice and putting needs of others before ourselves. It's a high bar and a high challenge for Christians to strive for. But in verse 13 and 14, we recognize the beginning of twos. I want you to realize in verse 13, through the end of this chapter, in Matthew chapter 7, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, how many times there's two, not three, not four, not zero, not one, two paths, two ideas. And we see the first of these in 13 and 14. There's the narrow way. What happens there? It leads to life. There are few who find it. The broad way leads to destruction. Now, why would so many go on the path to destruction when we could just choose that way that leads to life? Well, the description is here and clear in verse 13. The gate is wide and the way is easy. The truth is it's hard to be sacrificial. It's hard to treat others the way you want to be treated. It's hard to have mercy and grace. It's difficult to put others first, to put God first. But it's worth it. It's the right thing to do. It's what Jesus calls us to. It's what God demands and commands as our creator. The question is, which pathway am I on? Which pathway will I take? Verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And again, what do we have? Two. There is the good tree that bears good fruits and the bad tree that bears bad fruit. And so again, two, narrow way, broad way, good tree, bad tree, good fruit, bad fruit. There's also this, this line here in verse 15, very important verse, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. We are known how? How do we recognize them in verse 16? We're known by our fruits. And so again, there's a judgment of sorts that we're called to here. Kind of helps us understand more of the context of chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. But as we look at this, we realize that we are responsible for bearing fruit for Jesus. When God tells us what to do and we are on that narrow way, a necessary consequence of that will be Matthew chapter 6, serving others, albeit in private. Praying, albeit in private. Loving others sacrificially. To serve God will bear fruit. To serve self will not. It will bear either bad fruit or no fruit. And we know what happens to trees that are not worth what they are planted for. And then verse 20 says, thus you recognize them by their fruits. And in verse 19, trees that do not bear good fruit, cut down thrown into the fire. Notice with me again in verse 21, the theme here of two. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? 
And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Again, in verse 21, there's two groups. Those who do the will of the Father, those who do not. Those who will enter the kingdom of heaven, those who will not. Verse 23 has perhaps some of the most tragic and frightening words in the scripture where Jesus would look and say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. What is the dividing line between those who are saved and lost? What about that quote unquote middle group that we know doesn't exist because those who are good do what the good God says and determines is good. But how do we figure out where that line is? Well, first of all, we trust that God is the judge. Then we just have to do what he says. So the key is that second phrase, to do what he says. Notice in verse 21, imagine you're drawing a line on a piece of paper here. You say, who's saved and who's lost? Jesus does this for us in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, wants the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So on the side of the saved are those who do what God says, side of those who are lost, those who do not. Now, what does the what does scripture say? That's why we study the Bible and make sure that we are practicing what God has taught us and what he has instructed for us to do. But there's a very clear line that separates the narrow way from the broad way, those who are going to enter eternal life and those who will enter eternal punishment. It's those who do the will of God will enter that wonderful kingdom of heaven. So as you look at verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he's teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. And aren't those last couple of verses true? Jesus had great authority. He had great command and he was a wonderful teacher. He ends this great sermon on the Mount. He says it's recorded in Matthew chapter seven with one more set of two. There is the house that was built on the rock. And what, what does this person have? on the firm foundation. Well, they're wise and they hear the words of Jesus and they do them. And when the storms of life come, what happens to that house? It stands because its foundation is good. But then there's this other house and it's built on the sand. Now, there's some similarities here. First of all, it's a house. Second of all, it faced the same storm. And third, even if you notice in verse 25 and 26, the rain fell. That first house didn't fall, but verse 26, the rain fell again. But this is someone who hears the words of Jesus. The difference is, they don't do them. The foundation is different. So even though they heard the words of Jesus, even though it's still a house and the storm came, the difference was when this storm came, the house fell because its foundation was not solid. Our choice in listening to the Sermon on the Mount is to be challenged and to say, that is impossible, and to give up or say, I don't want to do that and give up, to take that easy broad way that leads to destruction. Or to say, my God is great. My Christ is loving. His authority is clear. He is the Lord, Lord, and King of Kings, and so I will be his servant. I will walk that narrow way. I will keep the words of Jesus. I will do what my heavenly father commands. Those are the choices. There's just two ways. There's not three, not four, not five. Two ways. The question in reading Matthew chapter five, six, and seven is, am I up for the challenge? And the answer is that I will fail. If that's what we think up for the challenge means, then the answer would be no. But God can help us. And that's why we need to have a prayer life that puts him first, that calls out to our God for help. That's why we need to be reading the scriptures to know what does God want from me? Where is that dividing line? What does it mean to obey him? Above all, I need to make sure that my heart is right. That I'm willing to serve God. God loved and he expects us to love because he first loved us. Isn't that amazing? God cares for us. He will answer us when we ask. He will hear us when we pray. We will serve him today. Challenges for you and for me. What will we do with the words of Jesus? I hope you join us tomorrow as we study Matthew chapter 8 and learn more about the life of our Lord.